Okay, so, um, well, thanks everybody for coming. And uh, we're very happy to have Matthew McCulloch here from CERN, who's going to be talking about dispersing new physics. So, um, Matthew. Okay, thanks very much. Um, it's good to see good to see some uh, familiar, friendly faces. Um, so, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about some, some stuff that I've been doing recently, just a couple of papers. Um, Robert asked if, if I'd be interested in talking about this recent paper on uh, fifth forces and things like this, um, which I'm, I'm very happy to talk about, but it's also, um, I think that paper alone is probably not enough for a one hour seminar, the content in, in terms of sort of the big picture. And also um, it's sort of part of a broader set of, of ideas that I've been exploring these last few years and I'm still, uh, or even more so these days, uh, uh, playing with. And these ideas are essentially to use um, you know, ideas from, from amplitudes and from dispersion relations, you know, really old school tools um, to see what we can, to, to apply them to, to Fino in various different ways. And so that I guess this is a, a, an effort, you know, there's all this amplitude and, and EFT hedron stuff going on these days. And this is sort of an effort um, aiming to be the, the sort of uh, Fino cousin or Fino branch of that in some sense. And, um, there's basically, the, you know, a few things I've been thinking about, but there's basically two, two papers of, from the last two years or so that have sort of been, been using these ideas. One was a, 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 an observation about um, uh, successive orders and effective field theory that was, uh, in, in our opinion, was crying out for a, an application. So we have applied it to the Higgs, so I will discuss the Higgs, although I think the most interesting part of that paper was probably um, just the observation about the momentum expansion. In, in, in an EFT. And then um, uh, the second thing, which I think is, is more interesting is, is sort of trying to use dispersion relations, which of course are not limited to effective field theories um, uh, as sort of general tools as a way of um, trying to see what general statements we can make about non-decoupled, weakly, uh, weakly coupled physics. So things that are in the realm of sort of the, the intensity frontier or, or uh, a fifth force type uh, frontier. And um, <clears throat> both of them sort of go hand in hand as, as different sides of the same coin. So uh, I, I sort of, sort of mushed them together for, for the talk today. Um, so I'll start with the Higgs because this was actually the, the first paper and it's really how I started sort of thinking about these things. And the sort of the Fino application is uh, to ask the question, how does the Higgs move? It's sort of a, a dumb question, right? But, you know, I think sometimes uh, we like to think of, of questions that you could might be able to discuss with someone on the street and many questions regarding the aspects regarding the Higgs are very difficult to, to have a short conversation about. But things like how does the Higgs interact with itself? Um, uh, how does the Higgs move? How does it get from A to B are sort of relatively simple ones. Of course, the, the, the more you know, the more practical way of phrasing that is, you know, what is the Higgs propagator, which was sort of the, 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 the idea behind this, you know, how well can we probe the Higgs off shell, right, since discovering it at the LHC. And um, if we could probe it off shell, what things could we expect to learn? And in thinking about propagators, the obvious place to go is um, a, a textbook material um, from any, any favorite textbook. Um, and it's uh, uh, the Callum Lehman representation, um, which we all learn is a very, very general uh, representation of a time ordered two point correlation function of uh, scalar operators. And so propagators, whether they are propagators for quasi-free fields like, like the Higgs or they're propagators in the sense of um, uh, two-point functions of composite operators that may be you know, related to some strongly coupled sectors or, or lots of different weakly coupled fields or something like that can be captured using the Kalanin representation. Now I understand everyone is knows this stuff so, but I, I want to go through it quite quickly to sort of show where different aspects of, of fundamental principles like unitarity and, and, and causality come into it. So as we recall, you know, we can start off writing any, any two-point uh, correlation function. That there's an assumption here that the, the uh, two operators are gauge invariant. Um, and then we can insert, as always, one in between, right? So we put uh, uh, one in between the two operators um, and uh, this gives us an integral and in sum over essentially a complete set of states, the Hamiltonian. Um, uh, 
uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with some, some uh, uh, fixed energies. Um, and so we put one in between and we can just you know, rearrange this. We start off with the two point uh, uh, correlation function on the left, we insert one, and then we can insert, um, uh, we can translate these operators from X and Y to zero by using the translation operator here. And the vacuum of course has no momentum. So you get nothing from this operating to the left. Um, and on the right, we pick up the four momentum essentially of, uh, of these states, px, whatever they are in, in some uh, frame, this whole thing's Lorentz invariant in the end of the day. So you can pick your frame. Um, and then we can uh, uh, take, that, take that step there, which was essentially just re related to unitarity and um, massage this a little bit further. We can pull out, insert a delta function just to set px to p, pull out, um, uh, uh, the momentum now and integrate over all of that momentum using this delta function and write it in this form form here. And we see that everything in, in these curly brackets, can you see my cursor, by the way, when I do this? Um, yeah, I can see it. I think we can see okay. it. Excellent. Okay, so um, then everything in this curly brackets is positive, positive definite, if the states are all positive definite, or, or in other words, that they have uh, uh, the, 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 uh, this matrix element here um, has a uh, positive norm. And um, so then we can just do a little bit more massaging and sort of uh, set some definitions really um, by writing this thing here as a as this whole sum and integral as a, uh, a theta function times some spectral density and um, inserting. So this is basically just a, a relabeling here. And then finally, we can rewrite this and this this whole thing here is 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 positive definite. And um, the theta function is just uh, uh, asserting that these are positive energy states. And uh, then we can, you know, using this, this relabeling, essentially rewrite this two point function in this way with the theta function and rho, which is a positive definite function. And we can recognize that this thing times the theta function is just this, um, I can't remember if it's advanced or retarded uh, uh, propagator. Finally, we use causality, um, which is to say that we can we can write the time ordered uh, two point function as as the the two different uh, two point functions with x and y reversed with the appropriate theta functions as a function of of the time coordinates, and recall that these advanced and retarded propagators satisfy uh, uh, this relation with the the Feynman propagator. To finally write it in this form here where we can write this, this time order two point function as the, the Fourier transform of this uh, function of momentum squared, um, of the four momentum squared, where this function is just this thing here, which is the, essentially the Feynman propagator times uh, integrated over uh, some, some weighting function rho, um, uh, which is a function of uh, essentially the mass squared of the states that uh, got inserted. So you're essentially integrating over the mass squared of those states. And this thing is positive definite. So these are the steps that uh, 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 we all know uh, implicitly, but I just sort of wanted to go through it um, just to sort of highlight where the different pieces of, of causality, unitarity, and essentially the whole thing was, was a relativistic derivation. So there's relativity in, assumed in there as well. So we know then, um, thanks to, to, to Callan Lehman, or I think I found some note by, by Sidney Coleman saying it should be pronounced Challen. So I, I, I'm gonna say Callan, but I think I may be incorrect saying, stating it that way. Um, that for example, if, if we were to apply this to, to any operator, scalar operator that we're interested in, including for instance, the Higgs, then the Higgs should have a, a Callan Lehman representation, the full interacting Higgs, right? So the, 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 the whole uh, real deal. We know that for a free field, um, we get the results that we know and love because uh, uh, the spectral density is just a delta function. There is only one state that this operator can, can uh, uh, create out of the vacuum, and that is a free state of, of uh, form moment energy uh, uh, equal to the, to the mass. And we've measured the pole. So, that, so for an in, a free field, uh, and which to, the, to some approximation the, the Higgs is, um, we would just have a delta function. But more generally, right, we have all of the interactions in, in the two-point function of the Higgs. There's all sorts of, of, of loop diagrams that we could draw and so on. And so <clears throat> there's, in, in reality, this, this will be some, uh, some continuous spectral density, not just a delta function. Um, but furthermore, if there would be SM states, then, then there would be the standard model piece and also some other piece that encodes the, the, the effects of the BSM states. I, I split it up in this way, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this rho x is only BSM because there could be contributions, say, of three loops or something that have mixed 
uh, insertions of states that involve BSM states and standard model states at some uh, uh, mass scale. Um, so it's just this, the definition of this is that it vanishes when, when in the standard model limit. And finally, this whole thing has to be positive definite. Um, so returning to this, the, you know, the, the, the density of states is really associated with um, uh, the poles and branch cuts. Um, at the mass scale of the new states. So if the new BSM states are heavy, then this row X is, is zero up until the, the mass of whatever states are involved. And using this, we can make some, some general statements. Um, so expanding the, the propagator in, in, in small momenta, so we can look at this, this integral and now the cutoff for, uh, uh, of Q squared for row X, because row X is vanishing below M squared can be taken in the integrand here, in the, uh, in the integral here to be m squared, uh, which is the mass of those states. And then when p squared is, is smaller than m squared, we can just tailor expand this whole, uh, this whole function. So when we tailor expand it, we get the, the standard model piece plus this extra piece that depends on, on heavy BSM states. So this is really now the, the, the step of taking the, the EFT limit of the dispersion relation, which was until this point, not making any assumptions about mass scales. But if we're working, if we're assuming that we're working at, at p squared below m squared, then the full propagator has is the standard model one plus some uh, sorry two point function is the standard model, model one plus uh, some Taylor series in p squared over m squared with some coefficient c n. Um, where these c n's we can rewrite just by relabeling the the integration variables uh, in this way. Um, so there's some comments. So this is purely theoretical. There'll be very little phenomenological application of this. Um, but just, I think there's some interesting theoretical uh, comments to make here. The first is you see that every CN is coming from the same spectral density um, with higher weightings. The, the, the N label, which is just the, the order in the P squared expansion, um, is only going into X here. And you see that X is, is less than or equal to one. So the higher the N, the smaller these, these integrals become. And, 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 what that, and furthermore, we can see that rho X, uh, of course, was positive. So we very quickly, now this is, this is a, a two-point function. So this is not an observable in the, the sense that a scattering amplitude would be an observable. I'll, I'll discuss scattering amplitudes in a, in, in a few slides. Um, but we can already see that if there's some, you know, if, if, if there's some new physics that's just coupled to, to, to a scalar operator like the Higgs, um, then to a good approximation, we can capture the effects of that new physics in this way. And so any amplitudes that are involving the Higgs uh, off shell would 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 be captured uh, uh, in this way. The corrections would be captured in this way, and we see that from rho being positive, we have that all of the CNs are positive. So this is like the baby version of the usual positivity arguments in in uh, effective field theories. Um, I say baby because it's applied only to the two point function here and not to the the full scattering amplitude. But far more interesting, in in my opinion, is that um, the series ha series has to be convergent. So CN is is uh, always bigger than or uh, uh, or equal to C n plus one, with the the uh, inequality being saturated for a tree level exchange. If you had some tree level insertion of of, of states, you they would all be one, uh, which just comes from expand, expanding one over p squared minus m squared. So this is 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 in my opinion much more more interesting because it's essentially telling you that um, that the usual power counting arguments for EFT that we normally uh, I think of as being sort of rather qualitative, but a good, but you know, uh, robust but qualitative. And um, this puts it on a very firm footing in the sense that um, always for that always the series is going to to converge. So that's why we call this the convergence uh, criterion because it really is is the definition of uh, D'Alembert's criteria for 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 convergence. Okay, so this is still all very theoretical, but you know, in principle, this means then if you were to measure some amplitude involving, uh, you know, some some scalar exchange, and if, if the external states were all weakly coupled, so the leading effects would be just from from the propagator corrections, then you could measure the p squared expansion, and you would measure. Uh, we're not calling them c's; we're calling them the a's, which are the actual uh, Wilson coefficients that you would measure. But you don't know what the cutoff is because you're working at low energies. So those a's are the c n's over the the relative. The relevant powers of m squared, but using this convergence criterion, you already know that that in as a function of the that those a's as if they have the same denominator, the same mass scale in the denominator, which they they will. Um, um, if if you measure them, the c's have to be 
uh, uh, convergent. And this means that you can get stronger constraints than you would just get from normally from, for, example, for instance, perturbative unitarity. And we've sort of plotted out these constraints from our paper. So if you measured C1 and C2, of course, they will be positive. So they will lie in this quadrant. Um, for a given A1 or, or A2, there'll be some uh, 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 limit from perturbative unitarity, which states that, you know, once you've measured that Wilson coefficient, just like with, you know, for instance, for the Fermi operator in the Higgs or, or, or the Higgs and, you know, W scattering and so on, um, there will be some uh, perturbative unitarity limit where something has to kick in or else the, the theory is becoming uh, strongly coupled. But on top of that, if you've measured two of them, um, you can use the, 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 the uh, you don't know what M squared, so that measuring two of them puts you on a curve in the, the, the plot of C1 and C2 where this curve is, uh, uh, um, moving along this curve just comes from moving your, varying your, you know, assumed cutoff M. And you can see that you can start to violate the convergence criterion before you even get to violate the, the perturbative unitarity uh, uh, limit, depending on, on what the, the coefficients are. And so if you do that, you know that if you've measured a uh, given A1 and A2 that traces out this curve here, for instance, then um, there's no theory that will saturate perturbative unitarity that will UV complete this thing. You're going to have something has to kick in before then. And you can actually then derive a, a limit on where the UV completion has to kick in, where, where you have to start to see some sort of pole or, or uh, um, branch cut just from measuring these two Wilson coefficients. Now, in practice, this is pretty much useless. I can, we brainstormed a lot and tried to think of something where this wouldn't be useless. And um, that's you. Yep. Uh, I wonder if I can ask one question here, sure. which is, I mean, if you're just requiring convergence alone, I always thought that um, that that wouldn't necessarily require that all the C's have that property. I mean, I, I could I can take arbitrary C's from say one to some finite number, and then after that finite number, impose that inequality, and I'd still get a convergence series. Right. So so absolutely yes. So yes, so exactly. So it's more than that. So this is stronger than that. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. So D'Alembert would say, um, you know, as you go to infinity, you have to converge, but you don't have to be. Is this is this this what you're saying? Um, whereas I think that only... sorry terms to it of any type you want, it's still convergent. Exactly, exactly. So that's is that's um, uh, uh, absolute convergence versus conditional convergence, right? No, no. no. Conditional convergence is something else. Uh, co conditional convergence involves sign issues of signs. Um, yes, but it depends on which side. Because when you when you flip, yeah, you know, like expanding one over one minus x on one side, you've alternating coefficients, and on the other side, you don't which reflects that um, you get a pole at, at x equals one. Um, but yeah, so that's, so indeed, so that's the, so D'Alembert's criterion is that, that uh, yes, not, not that all of them are smaller than the, the, the previous one, but uh, ultimately they become that way, I agree. Yeah. Whereas this, um, this condition here following from this states that in an effective field theory, all of them will be smaller than the previous one, uh, uh, which is stronger. Yeah, so maybe convergence isn't the right name for it. Uh, okay. Something, something a little bit stronger than that. Uh, yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Okay. Matt, um, um, before okay. you go on from the slide you were just on, yep. so two before this one. Yeah. Yeah, so can I, I, I ask a, what I think is a fairly simple question about the CN. So yep. the thing that looks weird to me about this is that the smallest ends are the ones that are most sensitive to rho x at the largest values, right? Like the smallest, like C0 seems to be much more UV sensitive than C1 or C2 or C3, et yeah. cetera. Um, yes. Why is that? But um, it's, I think it's because you've got x in the denominator. We did a silly change of variables here. So, so the mass scale, the highest mass scale is at the lowest x, because rho x, the argument of rho x is q squared, which is m squared over x. So, uh, uh, Wait, no, sorry. Right, so I, 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 that, I'm looking at the formula and I can see that the argument of yes. this is, oh, yes. like that's what I'm saying. Why, why is, if you go to the slide before this, you have this expansion in C, Cn and yes. I, 
would have expected that this would sort of be something like an EFT expansion where I might expect that the higher order terms are more sensitive to UV physics, but that's not what I'm seeing. When you write out this formula, the higher order terms are actually really only sensitive to physics right at the M squared scale. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, yeah, it's probably easier to see even from, from, from here, right? Um, no, it's a good point. So, so the CNs, so the CNs are, are one for, for tree level. So if you put the physics at, if you're imagining you just, you're, you're looking at the physics at, at, at one mass scale, then um, they're all sort of equally sensitive from that respect because rho x is a delta function at, at, mm -hmm. uh, at one. Um, but the fact that the, you know, if you have a continuum of states that you're sampling your, your, your uh, lower Wilson coefficients are sampling the tail of that continuum better than the, 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 the higher ones. Yeah, I don't really have a good, I've never I mean, thought about Jed, that. Jed, can I, just, I, can, can I just say something? I think yeah. this is just what you'd expect from decoupling, right? Higher order, so like more, more suppressed terms, you need a lower scale in order for those terms to be important. Yeah, no, that's a good way. It's uh, just that, right? Can I just say, this is something that's maybe more familiar when you look at uh, the E plus E minus to Hadron's cross section, that the lower moments are integrals over the whole spectrum, and but the cross section wiggles, and the wiggles are determined by the higher terms. So that's, that brings in the, the physics at lower scales than the global integral. It's very similar to that. I see. We didn't, yeah, we didn't. So number one about about uh, 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 the first comment, yeah, we didn't really think this through actually um, to think about a sort of qualitative understanding for the e plus e minus the hadrons. Yeah, we sh definitely should have done that. So you'll see, I've got an example. We tried to find a place where this is in useful, and we it did end up in e plus e minus, but we didn't think about hadrons, which is actually where it'd be probably carry more clout because it's a non-perturbative tool and and there's. Just, uh, just line people should look at figure 18.8 .8 in my textbook and the point will be made clear. Sorry, did you know uh, that by memory or do you have it open? <laughs> have it open. Okay. <laughs> should I get it? It's sitting over there. Maybe, maybe it, not. Yeah, it may just be a statement of decoupling. I, I have to think about it a little, little bit more. It, but Ro Robert may yeah, I think Maybe it's right. Correct. You know, if you put two delta functions, put two states, two two uh, two poles, and then you know the first one, all of them, all of the the CNs are 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 equally sampling. Whereas, exactly, it's it's decoupling, so you're just not getting sensitivity to the to the higher ones. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's further away. I think Robert's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um. So where could you use this? So we. So in principle, if this is ever going to be, so, so we, we're interested in effective field theories because they capture the leading effects of, of decoupled physics, right? But in reality, are we ever going to measure successive P squared terms in the, the expansion um, before we've actually just discovered the, 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 the particles themselves, right? Because you need to get more and more, if you're at low P, P squared, below M squared, you need to get higher and higher precision to be able to, to do some sort of global fit and extract those higher terms. Um, and by the time you've gotten that precision, you've probably built a, a better collider, right? A higher energy collider. And so we've rarely been, if, if we think historically in a situation where um, the precision was so good that you could measure higher order terms without having been you know, chronologically in a state where we've built a higher energy collider. Um, one, one example, which is not of that, of that uh, of that class because we couldn't really find any uh, that were particularly compelling. But one example is the low energy plus E minus um, uh, sensitivity to the, the Z uh, pole. So, or sorry, the Z pole. So, so of course there's the famous Z pole plot, but below the Z pole, essentially the, as, as the, the E plus E minus to, for example, mu plus mu minus um, cross section plot is starting to, to turn, turn over. Those are the p squared over m squared pieces coming from the z, right? And so, if you could measure them to, to high enough accuracy, you could use this convergence criterion to actually place a limit on where the new physics had to be. And we actually found doing this, you can fit 
to the high end tail using data from below 45 GB. This is a purely academic exercise for fun, but um, just to show that in principle, you know, with high precision, you could play these games. Um, you could fit to that tail that's starting to, 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 to show the presence of some heavy new physics even before you've reached it and um, extract limits on A1 and A2. And it turns out from, from that fit at 90% level, you could have said that the Z without any other information, of course, there was other information, so this would have been useless even at the time, but you could have said that the Z had to be uh, below 170 GeV, which is far, far stronger constraint than perturbative unitarity would have said. And so the, this is a very limited practical application, but it's not um, completely uh, out of, out of uh, uh, the realms of possibility that perhaps in some other setting, as, as Michael suggested, maybe in E plus C minus to hadrons, there are other places where this could have, uh, could have been useful. Okay. Matthew, Matthew can, I, can I make a comment on a, on yep. a possible use of this way of thinking? which is you, you haven't spoken about the fact that um, usual, you, usually we assume polynomial boundedness for the spectral density. Yes. And that's, that's just usually stated to be um, a feature of locality. I, I, don't, I don't think that's quite true. I think you can have weekly, um, there's some condition that you allow the spectral density to actually increase exponentially as long as the, the increase is not too fast exponentially there's some oh, there's some condition i don't exactly remember but i know if you allow a full increase full exponential increase then in fact you get um a form of non-locality there's sort of intermediate ranges like there's there's the kind of weak non-locality you get in string theory and then there is um, a much stronger true non-locality you get so you could you could if you're crazy enough start thinking about whether you, had, you could test such things in um test by looking at the spectral density then yes so two comments so the first is that if there is if we really applied this to the higgs which i haven't really discussed yet um then by doing it at dimension six and above is essentially making assumptions about the polynomial boundedness hmm. um uh so the poly the, the degree of boundedness directly impacts the number of subtractions you need yes yes definitely. And so so it's essentially saying that we don't need a counter term at dimension six um, so that's, that's, that's one implicit thing that, will, that I wasn't going to explicitly mention, but uh, is implicit here. The second thing is I completely agree. And I think almost the most, most fun and fun aspect of playing with these things is to try and see if we can get a handle on, um, without writing down models, which are always sick, uh, you know, how we can, can, can phrase, you know, what is violation of unitarity as an experimental observable or violation of, of causality as an experimental observable using these sorts of tools, which, which encode them in a very clean way, those, those principles. Because of course, if we try and write down non-local models and things, it gets very messy very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think there are, I, I do think, yeah, I agree with the spirit of what you said. That I think there. Um... Well, I, mean, I, I think this issue of, you know, once you, once you um, go away from polynomial boundedness, then that by the, probably Michael would know much better than me, but there's there's a whole bunch of um, studies by the people, the mathematical physicists yes. on exactly this issue. And I think there is a sort of delicate intermediate regime, if I remember correctly. Yeah. When there's still a net, there's still a definition of locality, but it's a little bit weaker than what we usually take for, you know, a finite number of species, you know, point particle theories. Yes. So we did, we did, I've got some backup slides. It's probably not very interesting. We did play with stringy amplitudes because they satisfy this thing. And you can actually extract some, you say mathematicians, you can extract some interesting uh, equalities about Bernoulli numbers um, by uh, assuming the, or by showing the convergence of stringy amplitudes, but we didn't think uh, about locality. Um, okay, no. so, so how does this all tie in with the Higgs sector? I'm not going to talk about this much because this, uh, you know, we've just discovered the Higgs. There's absolutely no way we're ever going to measure the second order term in the, the P squared expansion for the Higgs propagator. And in fact, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, show that actually even measuring the first one is very hard. So as regards to the first question of, you know, how does the, the Higgs move? Um, it's actually not, not a, we're not in a great, uh, in great shape. So there are all of these Higgs, Higgs related uh, EFT operators that we, we, we know and love or hate, uh, uh, depending on how much you like looking at lots and lots of operators. But um, of course, there's many ways to categorize them. Dimension six is the first interesting dimension really for, for 
uh, Higgs physics. Um, I like to categorize them according to, to H bar counting. I find it very, very useful. And when we do this, uh, we can sort of categorize them a bit more straightforwardly. So for example, O6 um, up here is super special because it has four uh, uh, powers of coupling in the, the numerator, which is the reason that if you insert O6 into a, uh, any uh, one loop diagram, it will not generate logarithmic divergences unlike all of these other operators as a general statement. And that's simply because you cannot have a counter term because, because it has done a, a coupling dimension uh, six. If you have one H bar, um, then you've already, uh, 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 only that can move you down to coupling dimension two. And if you add anything onto that operator to make it a one loop diagram with an interaction, then it goes back up above coupling dimension two again, which, where is, which is where all these other operators lie. So that's why that operator doesn't give you divergences when you stick it in a loop. On the other end of the spectrum, um, at zero coupling dimension is this operator here, which uh, modifies the Higgs propagator in a gauge invariant way. So this is, you know, uh, covariant derivative squared here. And so that's the operator we're sort of interested in if we want to talk about um, BSM corrections to the Higgs propagator. Um, and um, it's completely uh, analogous in a sort of Higgs sector way to the old uh, Peskin Takuchi uh, uh, sort of program, where, you know, in the past, for um, uh, thinking about electroweak physics, we had the oblique corrections, which uh, were, you know, the super powerful tool about mapping out the UV um, above the weak scale, even though. Um, all we have is precision uh, measurements at the weak scale at, at LEP. And <clears throat> even going forward, they're going to be super useful at the LHC because uh, these two ones in particular, the W and Y parameters, because they give you the, the leading order in the P squared expansion of the, the W and Z propagator uh, uh, corrections. There's also the, the Z parameter, which does it for the gluons. And these grow with energy. So there's sort of been this real revival in, these, the, in recent years. Uh, showing that these operators are, are, are super well constrained by uh, proton colliders, uh, which is great. And they will be competitive with LEP uh, in a few years, if not already, for those parameters, not for ST. And so similarly, um, it seems a good idea to start thinking about the Higgs sector in a, in a, in a way which is inspired by, by that uh, program. And so we sort of rather cheekily called it the, the, the H parameter, which is just like the, the W and Y parameters are the, the, the coefficients of the, the operators that lead to those corrections, these sorts of uh, operators here. Um, uh, we call it the, the H parameter. And um, it all also contributes to amplitudes, not all amplitudes because the gauge invariance does uh, uh, some funny tricks, but it, uh, to many amplitudes, it contributes in an energy growing manner, just like um, the W and Y parameters. And, we found that the most promising place to get any sort of constraints on this operator, um, sorry, I'll just write it here again, this operator here, just a standard dimension six operator and, and, and uh, standard model. Um, we find that the, 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 the most promising avenue is to take, we have to take the Higgs off shell to get sensitive to this operator basically in that basis. You can do a change of basis where you move that operator into a whole bunch of other ones with fermions and, and the Higgs self-coupling modification, which is entirely equivalent. But just like with you know, the utility of, of uh, the W and Y parameters, we're packaging it just as a propagator correction. And the most promising place is to take the Higgs off shell in four top production. Um, so we can relate this Higgs H parameter defined in the same way as the W and Y parameters. Um, uh, to the Wilson coefficient C box over M squared, where M is really the scale of UV physics. So we have to be careful that we don't, if, if we assume some C that we're not violating, uh, 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 you know, if, that we're not um, violating the effective field theory uh, rationale in the first place by thinking about momentum above that M squared. So we can relate them in this way. And we did some not so, not so trivial estimates of what you could be sensitive to. And this is, H bar on the, the, the X axis, and these are curves of, of constant C box as a function of M cut, which is essentially where we cut the, the, the events so we weren't violating the AFT. So it's sort of an assumption about what the um, mass scale of new physics is. Um, this is super duper perturb, per, you know, non perturbative. This is worryingly non perturbative. And then this is all sort of perturbative regime. And uh, at High Lumi LHC, we find that you, know, you can only just start to scratch. The surface of some relatively perturbative uh, UV completions. To go more perturbative, you would really need to go to something like um, 
uh, uh, and, and more sort of interesting in terms of the, the, the landscape of UV completions that could have generated that operator. Um, if you really want to talk about measuring the, the, the modifications to, to the Higgs propagator, you would need to go to something like a 100 TV proton proton collider, loads of off shell Higgses. Um, okay, although I should say so, CMS did an estimate and they do a little bit better than us. Uh, this is from a few years ago. So maybe our estimates are a little bit pessimistic. We were quite conservative in how we set them and how we cut events and things like this. So you can maybe do a little bit better, um, but probably not, you know, uh, orders of magnitude better. So I still think we're a long way away from really making any meaningful statements about, you know, how the Higgs moves, if you were to talk about that. Of course, it's, it's the, the Higgs propagator is not, a, you know, a physical observable like an amplitude. So this comes with caveats. But nonetheless, at the same level that we talk about the W and Y parameters, uh, if we talk about the Higgs in the same sort of language, we've got a long way to go, which means, you know, in my opinion, that we should be, be, be humble about how well we, how much we say that the Higgs is standard model-like, because it's standard model-like and so far in the things we can access, um, but we shouldn't um, uh, venture, I think, yet to assume that it is in, in all its other aspects like this or with the Higgs self-coupling, for instance. Okay, a little comment on scattering amplitudes, which are, you know, on a much firmer basis than propagators in terms of, of observables. Matthew, so you can do, sorry, yep. Uh, before you go into the next subject, I'm just curious. If you uh, use the changes of basis, so you try and remove box H everywhere, yep. this becomes a four top operator yep. explicitly. Exactly, exactly. So that's where you see, um, and that's why, you know, this, term here has really become a contact interaction. Yeah. So you put that in here and you see it's four tops. Got it. Thank you very much. Which means as well, you know, I think, so this can be taken under the banner of four top physics, but you know, people rarely think that they're doing Higgs physics when they're measuring four tops. But in fact, you know, uh, uh, up to the fact that these are all, it's just as much four tops as it is Higgs propagator, whether you, you know, it's not one or, or the other in terms of effective field theory, because you can't tell the difference. Yeah, um, all these tests are, it's a very interesting story. Yeah, I think it's something that's sort of been a little bit missed because of the Warsaw basis, basically. Uh, you know, when we, when we redefine these operators away, I think we intuitively look at the fields in the operator and think that that's the physics it corresponds to, which can trick us, right? Because we can just change, equivalently change the basis where there's those fields of don't even enter and and it it speaks of very different physics with exactly the same observables so i think we need to be a little bit careful uh, uh, sometimes with that okay um so the whole this whole program we we put this in an appendix and i regret it now because it seems to be a, a topic that more people are getting interested in um you can do the whole thing for scattering amplitudes uh which is on, on a much firmer basis these are really observables there's no uh, uh, question about whether it's a propagator or, or you know, four tops, just like Michael said. Um, and in, in, in scattering amplitudes as well, the P squared expansion of something like a forward scattering amplitude um, satisfies exactly the same sort of thing. So there's positivity, which we all know and love, but also convergence. So the, if, if M is the scale at which the, 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 um, there is a new pole or branch cut in the propagator, and uh, sorry, in the scattering amplitudes, then um, uh, the, the Wilson coefficients have to satisfy exactly the same uh, convergence condition. And, and you can also massage this, you can sort of play around with it and you see that this will also, uh, they will tend to unity, they will, they will approach one as you go to, to infinity. And so this is also, this has become, uh, I think, interesting to a broader community. Um, and it tells you that the EFT, you know, it's not a, it's not a peculiarity of, of two-point functions in Kalen Lehman, but really the EFT expansion in energy, in energy, you know, P squared over M squared is absolutely convergent. And you will never get in any UV completion, a higher power term, which is larger than the one before it, um, which rules out a lot of sort of wacky uh, BSM models. There, so, so these other papers, um, I've also made similar statements going much, much beyond it. So this, this paper here is the one by uh, Francesco Riva and Mark Rimbaud and, um, and uh, Brando Bellazzini and Riccardo Rotazzi, I think it was with all the authors, I hope. Um, 
from just before Christmas where they, they, they show this and then much, much more. They have these moment curves. So they show that there's not only just this convergence criterion, but an entire family of criterions uh, of criteria, um, which, which uh, uh, are satisf satisfied, um, and, you know, be going beyond and including this convergence one. And also um, this recent EFT hedron paper by NEMA and collaborators also uh, encodes the same thing. Uh, so there's, 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 but also and much more. So this, con this convergence thing in both of these papers is a, is a minor aspect, uh, uh, but nonetheless, it's starting to sort of, I think uh, many people are starting to look in, in towards that uh, direction for understanding EFTs. Okay, so the last 15 minutes, I'll get to the thing that I was asked to talk about. So I apologize for that, um, which is this recent uh, work with Hannah Banks. So uh, skip this evidence for dark matter. Uh, dark sector, I think um, it's very sane to think that given the complexity, you know, not just the number of fields we have, but complexity we have in the visible sector, that even if the dark sector, we don't know what it is, I sort of tend to believe, as I think many people do nowadays, that um, there could be extraordinary complexity out there. And in fact, maybe nature suggests that there should be complexity out there. And of course, uh, uh, looking for light, new, new fields, uh, and sectors is, is extremely well motivated. Um, if we were to do that, then how can we package the physics and what can we say that's sort of model independent? Well, we don't, if, if the physics is light and on shell in whatever processes are, are going on, then we can't use an EFT. So the EFT game is, is, is out the window, but we still have things like the Kalman Lehman representation, we still have dispersion relations, which don't care about whether you decide to take the EFT limit or not. They're perfectly well valid when the new physics is, uh, is on shell. And I think this is a very useful way uh, of thinking about hidden sectors. I think it's, it's a way that could be useful as we sort of continue to go in the, the sort of fifth forces and, 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 and you know, quantum sensing uh, uh, realm. I think the dispersion relations could be a very useful tool in, uh, in terms of sort of trying to categorize without committing to models, trying to categorize um, new physics effects and look for wacky things. And so if we have some hidden sector operator that may be a single scalar field or maybe uh, a whole bunch of fields or, or some, you know, some things that we can don't even really uh, know how to describe other than there's just some, some composite operator. If that is weakly coupled to some standard model field, say these are two fermions, for instance, two protons or something like that, then if that coupling is weak, um, at lowest order in the, the coupling expansion, um, the only thing that matters is diagrams like this, where I have two insertions of this operator, one here and one here. And that will generate all of our sort of BSM effects. And you can see that the callan lehman representation is perfectly applicable in these sorts of scenarios, because we have a weak coupling here and a weak coupling here. So it really is the propagator correction, not correction, the propagator, uh, of the whatever is in the hidden sector um, that matters. And it doesn't matter that we're not working with, you know, um, for instance, scattering amplitudes here because we have a uh, weak coupling is pointing in this direction. You know, if we went to something where we had four, you know, four insertions of OHS, then we'd have lambda to the four and that would be uh, subleaning. And so the fifth force is captured by the two point function of whatever this operator has to be. And um, so again, we can go back to the Kalanin representation. I won't, I won't uh, go back into it. Um, but uh, then this means that we can just insert this very general uh, um, uh, representation of a two-point correlation function into things like Born's approximation to calculate uh, the, the potential generated by some hidden sector fields. And we can use the Kalanin representation. Uh, here it is again and just shove that into the Born approximation. And we find that the, a very general representation for uh, uh, the potential generated by two scalar gauge invariant operators. So this is scalar scalar. So this does not apply if you have something like a vector operator or something like this, um, is this form here. And you can see that, um, and this is rho, which is at the spectral density of, of whatever the hidden sector operator happens to be. And it, as I said, it doesn't care if we're talking, if the hidden sector itself is perturbative or strongly coupled or, or minimal or very complicated, it doesn't really matter because this is, is, is so general. And so the, the, the potential that you, that you generate between uh, two standard model objects, say two you know, fermions or something like this, um, takes this form here. 
And if rho, how do we recover the usual Yukawa force? It's just the, a delta function. There's only uh, one state at one mass scale. So you put in a delta function, you of course, um, uh, uh, end up with the standard Yukawa uh, interaction. Um, also, there are some interesting points. So, so for scalar scalar operators, um, you get a, an attractive force um, because this is positive. Also, you, by playing around with it, you can see that there are no turning points. So the, the, the dependence of this force on distance has to be monotonic, which is something I guess we all expect, but it's sort of nice to be able to derive it. Um, question, okay, so can, can, can I just insert one question? The, uh, the fact that you're getting uh, um, attractive forces because you assumed that it was a scalar or yes, exactly. um, is, is there any way to mock this up where you would have an effective spin one exchange? Right, so yes, yeah, so spin one would give the, the, the opposite and right. as, as you're suggesting. And so you can do it. And so there is a Callan Neiman for, for spin one. It's in, um, it's, it's it's in Zuber has spin half as well. Um, uh, most textbooks have spin zero, but you can do it. And also, you know, in Weinberg's um, some rules, those papers have the Callan Lehman ascent. He doesn't write it that way, but the Callan Lehman for spin one because he's assuming some vector currents. Um, and what you get is the same thing, but you have a spectral density multiplying the metric and a spectral density multiplying essentially p mu p nu if we go into that momentum representation. And so you have two separate spectral densities. If you assume that there's a gauge symmetry that sets them to be equal or opposite with opposite sign. But if you don't assume any gauge symmetry, then um, they have two spectral densities and things become uh, a bit more complicated. But I think you can make general statements and, and we've thought about uh, going in that direction. I mean, so is this but basically- also this means all these statements I'm going to make. Sorry. Oh, sorry, just gonna, is this basically the longitude on transverse spectral densities if you decompose like that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So if, exactly, so if it's, if it's, um, if there's a gauge symmetry, and this can be non-linear gauge symmetry, so this is, it works for, for example, for for massive vectors. But if you assume underneath there the the whole thing that there's some gauge symmetry going on, then then the form of the longitudinal to transverse gets fixed. Um, but if you don't, you know, if you imagine that this is uh, something like a row meson, then you have to make additional assumptions. Um, and it's not so clear, but you know, the, there's a couple of papers by Weinberg when, when he was deriving the, the sum rules that have some very nice um, discussion of how to use this thing. He never calls it the Callan Neiman, but that's simplicity uh, what he's doing, I think. Um, Okie doke. So yes, so also how there's, I should say that, so this caveat, I'm gonna say it a few times, but I want it to be clear that, you know, what I'm say is only going to apply to scalar scalar operators, because indeed, because of your comment, you know, if it were spin one, spin one and scalar scalar at the same time, then you could get interference, which could completely um, change this no turning points because you could have an attractive force that's more attractive at, than, the, the, than the repulsive force at some scale, but not at the other. So. That's a caveat that, that that's that applies throughout. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, so how might we use this? So I, I I'm going to give some examples. I actually don't really like them anymore, but because it's loops, and it, so when we can do perturbative calculations, why bother uh, using this sort of technology? Um, but just to show how it works. So of course, um, the spectral density is the imaginary part of the, 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 the propagator, right? That's the, the great thing about these analyticity arguments. Um, and so if we want to calculate, you know, if we have some model and we want to calculate what this, uh, what this thing is, all we need to know is the, the imaginary part of it. All we need to know essentially is the cut diagram. And so that this can actually be a useful tool. So we, we reproduced some results in the literature looking at um, higher dimension operators that are exchanging light states. So you have states that are running in a loop. So you might have a pair of scalars or a pair of fermions and so on. These are these different operators. And, and in reality, using this, I mean, you don't need to use this. It would, it would have been obvious already just from using you know, cutting in the loops, but it has a nice mapping onto this spectral density sort of language. Um, you just cut these diagrams and look at you know, essentially the, 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 uh, uh, the amplitude as if it were some sort of momentum squared decaying into this cut diagram here. And for all of these things, we could, you know, very quickly reproduce 
um, the results that have been derived in the literature for these different models um, using you know full loop calculations with, with counter terms and things like this. So it's quite nice that you can save yourself a bit of work. Uh, and you see what the spectral densities look like. They're theta functions, so they turn on at some mass scale multiplied by, by some function that's related essentially to, um, uh, to like a, what looks like a phase space. Um, and yes, this match some, some older models. You can even take it even further if you're really uh, uh, a masochist and you know, go to higher loops. So we could using this cutting technique, um, which is just a standard loop technique. It's not you know, unique to this, this sort of counting representation type of stuff, but nonetheless um, uh, could easily get you know, what the, the spectral density is for a three loop exchange. The last integral we couldn't do analytically, uh, but the punchline is that this is essentially um, a, a nice way of working with models. Personally, I think of the, the most interesting applications we didn't do, which is you know thinking about weirdo CFT sectors or something like that is probably where the most fun would be. Um, one nice thing is that you know for any given model, we could then we went through the literature and recalculated um, the observables for different types of fifth force experiments. So. Uh, especially at Stanford, you'll all be very familiar with these, but things like molecular spectroscopy, bouncing neutrons, and the, 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 the observables are usually things, are usually shifts in energy, and um, <clears throat> relying on, you know, here for molecular spectroscopy and, and integral over the wave functions and things like this. But what we've, we've shown here is the completely general, for two scalar operator insertions, the completely general form. So this row is now completely general. So for any model, you know, you could just pick that imaginary part of one of those loop diagrams or or something more interesting and shove it in and that would uh, feed it out rather than sort of recalculating for, for a new model each time. So we did this for, for many of the, the um, main, um, main uh, approaches for, for fifth forces um, all the way up to the, to the moon where you see you've got the, the spectral density in here. Okay, so for these one loop examples, we did some plots um, comparing these different, these different uh, 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 limits. So you see uh, molecular spectroscopy quickly becomes uh, the most uh, constraining. Um, and the reason for that is, is as we're going to higher and higher dimension operators, they're becoming, even though the fields are light, these are becoming very short range force. So the shorter range you can do, the better. This is sort of the reason I don't like the, the, the fact that we did these examples, because obviously you can just see by the dimension of the operator, what uh, type of experiment is gonna win. I think the more interesting thing about maybe comparing different experiments and seeing uh, what the best approaches are, is if you have something that is relevant over lots of different scales or interesting over lots of different scales, which you didn't really look into. Um, almost more important, so this is, a, I guess, from the perspective of a hobbyist, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I like the idea, it's probably insane, but I like the idea that, you know, we, we discuss a lot of the time that new physics, that and the deep UV, our usual notions of locality and causality, for instance, may be, uh, 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 com you know, completely inapplicable and especially locality, you know, usually referring essentially to, to what we expect to go on with gravity and the deep UV. But I sort of like the idea that perhaps um, these fundamental principles that we are so attached to um, could also be invalid on long distance scales, be, be break down in the in the IR and and maybe we haven't seen that just because it's very very weakly coupled to us now I can't write down a single model that's seen that would do this so it's it's purely wild speculation but nonetheless you know using something as and this is sort of related to John's comment earlier using something that's very robust looks like one of the kids is up so using something that's very robust that um does not um, uh, uh, re rely on assuming a specific model, like the Kalan Neiman representation, these sort of, and more generally, these dis dispersion relation uh, tools that we have at our disposal, you can sort of see what would be symptomatic of something going wrong. So if you, in an ideal world, could, um, were aware that the thing creating a fifth force that you discovered was scalar and form, so if you could somehow measure the spin structure, and you saw it to turn over the limits, for instance, to turn over, essentially if there was a turning point so the, the force was not monotonic with energy anymore then that would really be telling you something deep of course in reality that's 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 going to be very very hard to do so it's it's really just wild speculation but i like the idea that that these sorts of tools can sort of map out crazy space without ever having to build the crazy model in the first space first place okay so i should really wrap up because i'm 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 at an hour now 
Um, so yeah, so uh, you know, the whole uh, uh, approach in, in, in this talk is really to, to think about these old school tools and not even as, as advanced as what the Amplitude people use. This is just Callan Lehman, which is sort of like, I think the sort of nascent, you know, tool of, of the full S matrix program in some sense, right? This is the thing that really was playing around with, with causality and, and unitarity and, and deriving general uh, things from quantum mechanics with, without relying on much quantum field theory assumption at all. Um, and so I think it's very useful to play with and uh, interesting to play with and, and also potentially useful for, for BSM, for Fino applications, especially as we st are starting to probe and think about much more exotic things than we may be uh, used to. Um, I also think it's very interesting because when, when new physics is, is decoupled, we have the EFT limit, which is very powerful and useful. Of course, these dispersion relations can tell us interesting things about EFTs like positivity and convergence. But I, I think maybe more interesting is, is on the weakly coupled front where we can use them even when uh, 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 physics is not, you know, new physics is not decoupled. So I think it's a really neat tool. I also think, uh, I'm sure you're, many of you are aware, but, but um, Gunnar Callan had a, the, both are very, very interesting theorists, of course, but had a very interesting life and, and um, even died in a, in a flying his own plane, I think to CERN or from, from CERN or something like this. So if you're, uh, uh, want to waste some time on Wikipedia or online or some interesting articles to read. Um, okay, I've already said this. Um, and, and yeah, so this is the punchline for me, I think, and probably most relevant or interesting to this audience is that I think you know, thinking about these dispersion relations is maybe a, a great way to, to categorize um, non-decoupled new physics without having to do this sort of committing to a model, you know, a, each time and then calculate limits and so on. Um, uh, and I think I guess I should finish there because I, I, I've slightly run over time. Okay, well, um, thanks very much, Matthew. That was great. Um, let me uh, stop the recording, I guess.